The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Bible's Church this morning and turn to one of our theme verses, and that is Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Titus 2, 13. We're looking at today what is called the blessed hope, but what we're going to use as the blessed hope, as you'll see in a moment, as a catalyst, as a, a starter for bringing all of this month's messages together regarding us being as Christians, regarding what the Bible says are the last days, and regarding how we should be living. Today's message is entitled, While We Wait. Write that down if you would. It's important in your note-taking. While We Wait. And the text is Titus 2.13. I don't know about you, but waiting is one of the most difficult things in the world for us. Waiting. And it doesn't matter, it seems, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. If we're waiting to hear the good news or if we're waiting to hear the bad news, waiting does not come natural to us. Do you know what I mean? I think our culture imitates that. Everything has got to be in a hurry. So much so that you and I haven't even picked up on it of late. Everything's got to be now. We can get this to you in 60 seconds. We can get to you this immediately. And if you're, God forbid, but if your computer is somehow a couple of seconds low or slow when you hit the return button, you got to buy a new computer. It's too slow. And uh, it's amazing how we've been conditioned to have everything quick and now. But God calls the Christian to be in a state of waiting, waiting for his promises, waiting for his coming, waiting for heaven while we wait, being our title. It requires for us to be somewhat disciplined. To ask certain questions, for example, as, what are we waiting for? And how long do we have to wait? And what are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting? The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is going to come back. Listen, church, listen carefully. Some people give up on waiting. Christians today, or I should do it or say it like this, Christians today are giving up on waiting. Jesus hasn't come back, and... and taken them out of trouble. Jesus hasn't come back and delivered them from this bad marriage or from this financial situation or from this, this sickness or disease, and so they give up. Their faith caves in because Jesus, in their opinion, has not come back based upon his timing. Listen, that very temptation to give up is an announcement that we need to be disciplined in waiting. All of us need to be waiting, and it's hard. I, I confess that. Biblical waiting, my friend, as we'll see today, is not just killing time. You know how we kill time? You know, if you go to a movie and you're, you're just, what are you, you're waiting. You're waiting to see cars <laughs> or despicable, I say despicable me. That's how my granddaughter, what is the name of it? Dis, despicable me. I know it by its official title in our home. Our granddaughter says, I want to go see despicable me. And we got to wait 40 minutes of, of all this other junk before the cartoon comes on. And I don't like waiting. But we are to wait. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, verse 15, it says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most. That word in some translations is redeeming the time or every opportunity because the days are evil. We are to be renewing or waiting, making most of every opportunity. One of the great verses and beloved verses of all of the Bible, Isaiah 40, verse 31. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you feel like your strength is waning? Listen, be honest. I'm going I'm to ask you that again and say yes, okay? 
because I know it's true. My strength often, often feels like it's waning. Do you ever feel like your strength is waning? Oh, me too. I know what you mean. (laughs) Because when we're living and fighting and contending and walking this Christian life, there's this temptation to get so busy about things and we can also be tempted with becoming impatient that we often lose or weaken in our strength. The Bible says, wait upon the Lord. He shall renew our strength. Regarding us, he promises, we shall mount up with wings like eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. That's a great promise. You cannot embark upon a biblical study of reading of the Bible without coming to the repeated challenges from Old and New Testament alike church to be waiting for God, to be waiting. So in your notes, I want you to be writing, this is a sermon about waiting, but why did I wait till the end of the month to give you this message? Because all that you've heard, listen, Charlie Campbell blessed you big. Dr. Mark Hitchcock blessed you big. You have heard messages all this week. And what is it to do in our lives? It is to strengthen you in waiting until the Lord comes or until you and I go see him in the time that he has prescribed for us. This is vitally important. In the midst of all of our waiting, we learn this from the Bible. We are to have an urgent, passionate, devotional commitment to the return of Christ. Over and over again, the Bible says this. In fact, in the beloved parables of Jesus... More than any other theme in all of the parables is the coming back of the master or to be ready for you know not when the hour is. He, Jesus tells us over and over again, be ready for you do not know when the time is. And that entails that we be waiting. Before we get into these points this morning, you ought to mark this down. Jesus' last words given to us in the Bible, his last words given, Revelation twenty two twenty says, Jesus speaking, surely I come quickly. Now, if your name is Shirley, you better be listening up to that carefully. But if your name is Bob and and, and Billy and Susie, it applies to all of us. Jesus is saying, I'm coming quickly. Your temptation and mine is, well, then hurry up. Let's get this show on the road, Jesus. I want, oh, he is. He is, but he, listen, he moves to his timing. And God is at work. When you look around the world, listen, Are you listening? Christian, listen. The things that tend to trouble us quickly on the surface, violence. Look at the violence that's going on. Look at the the global dislocation from reason. Look at the crazy things that are taking place. Without viewing this biblically, the first initial rise up in your heart is almost a sense of panic. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. Oh my goodness, look at that. Oh, look at that. Wait, 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 wait. Christian, you're a Christian. In your waiting, you understand these are indications of the nearness of Christ. It's never been like this before. And that's vitally important to understand. In my deep reading and study for this message, I came across Dr. Seuss, who said, how did it get so late so soon? Isn't that a great statement? Do you ever feel like that? How did it get so late so soon? So here we are in our study Titus chapter 2. In fact, look in your Bibles. Uh, Look at starting at verse 11 down to verse 14. But again, our text is verse 13. Paul says to Titus, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. By the way, Bible student, it means nothing more is needed. There's no new revelation. There's there's not going to be another word from God. There's not going to be some other sacrifice. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared appeared, past tense. God provided you salvation for eternal life to all men. Teaching, verse 12, that is instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. By the way, the Greek implies that whatever generation of believer reads this, it applies to them. Our present age Verse 13, here's our text. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. What's his name? Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. By the way, once and for all he gave himself. No other offering God will accept. That he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Amen, huh? Total redemption. And purify for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. That's the life of the Christian. That's the Christian life. 
That is an awesome declaration. The word looking here, as we get into the study, mark it down. The word looking, listen, means this. To admit in, the word actually means to intercourse with God. The word means to open up to hospitality. It means to be waiting, enduring with expectation. Looking, what a great, tremendous word in the Greek. To be intercoursing with God in constant communication. Though our feet are walking on this earth, our heart and our mind and our eyes are scanning the horizon for the Lord's return. What a great way to live. We need to be reminded of that more and more because, you know, we have a tendency to get our roots dug down deep in this earth and hang on. And this earth is perishing, but heaven is getting closer every day. And that is a great and awesome truth. W.A. Criswell, the great Bible teacher now gone to be with Jesus, says here in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2 verse 3 is found one of the great theological statements in all of the word of God that is undeniable. It is that Jesus Christ is almighty God. Notice that it says here that we are looking for not just the rapture, not just heaven. Do you know what makes heaven heaven? We're not, listen, I'm not, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm not excited so much about the rapture event taking place, or quite frankly, I'm not so excited about dropping dead. I'm excited about meeting Jesus. You don't want to drop dead and not meet Jesus. That's not a good day, and it is not a good forever. <laughs> it's not that the trumpet's going to blow at some point in time, and, and we're going to be raptured up, as the Bible says, and meet Christ. That's cool, but it's meeting Christ that matters. It's meeting him. And it's not just being in heaven where, you know, it's pearly gates and all of the biblical characters are there and it's just, you know, 74 degrees forever and all that. That's wonderful. That's not that. It's, listen, it's wherever Jesus is. Remember when the disciples got in the boat to cross over to the other side? There were several boats and and they were all in a storm together. Do you remember that? But Jesus was asleep in one of the boats. I'm going to give you one chance to answer this question. Out of all the boats crossing over in that armada, and Jesus was in one of them, which boat would you want to be in? It's not the boat that gets you to the other side. It's Jesus in your boat. And I want to ask you this morning, is Jesus Christ in the boat, as it were, of your life? While we wait, mark it down, number one, it is this. While we wait, we're to be building upon our faith. Building upon our faith. I wish this was our only point. I could spend forever on this, but I cannot do that. We're to be building upon our faith. Everything you and I do is to be strengthened in our faith as Christians on a daily basis. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How do you do that? Praying in the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. Praying even when your mind is not even understanding what is not is what going around you, you don't get it. But even what you're saying to God, you don't get. But you're committing it to the Lord. Verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Stay in love with Jesus. Keep dating Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. Get alone with Jesus. Don't relegate yourself to Christianity being on Sunday morning, but every moment, every day. Next thing, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's the exact same word, looking. To be, as it were, intercoursing with God to the point where you can't wait for him to return, that his coming dictates everything that you do in life. The word building here is a tremendous word. It means to lay one layer upon another very slowly, very systematically. You are to build your faith on a daily basis. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, Peter says, but also for this very reason, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. Ooh, boy, do we need that today? Self-control? Self-control. People are, have lost self-control. It's one of the fruits, by the way, of the Holy Spirit. Perseverance. Perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is an awesome statement. By by the way, I'll throw this verse in. comes off the top of my head. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing. How do you build up your faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Did you know that your faith this morning is going to be built up? 
You know how you work out and you feel like your muscles straining or pumping up and all that kind of stuff? Well, you're not going to feel that today that way. Your faith, though, listen, your faith, as you hear the word of God today, and you're going to hear verses. That's why, you know what? I don't panic too much about sermons that I'm delivering, failing or not. Because sometimes they come across better than others. Sometimes I physically feel better, and that helps. It's the whole package thing, you know. And I, and I don't entertain that too much in my mind for this reason. I learned years ago from Charles Spurgeon in reading one of his books that if you stuff your sermons full of Bible, no matter what you think or feel, you'll never fail. Why? Because it's the Bible. It's the Word of God. And the hearer will have their faith built up, not based on who's speaking, but based on the Bible. You go to a church and there's sermons without Bible or very little Bible or no Bible at all, you're not going to have your faith growing. It won't. The Bible is the living word of God. The Bible says in Revelation 1 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this book or prophecy and keep the things which are written in it for the time is near. Book of Revelation says you listen, you hear it, you read it, you'll be blessed. Think of that. Most important thing while we are waiting is that we are building up our faith. Number two, while we are waiting, we're to be assisting in the proclamation or the proclaiming of the gospel. Every one of us as Christians are to assist to the proclamation of the gospel. Thank God, last night and today, Greg Laurie is in Philadelphia preaching the gospel to America. Harvest America is going across The United States, the gospel was being preached and last last night in Philly, thousands of people accepted Christ. How many more were listening, accepting Christ? And you say, well, that's great for Greg Laurie. No, 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 no. Listen, Greg Laurie is the mouthpiece, but I got to put some money in that direction to help him do that. I got to pray. Or today, you can enter into that labor. You can pray for the results of tonight. Pray for Greg's throat, for for example. Whenever he preaches like that, he loses his voice. He's got to have doctors come in and help him out just to deliver the message again. That's part of the attack. But get involved. Did you tithe this morning? This church has engineered it in such a way that a portion, I don't care if you put 10 cents in the offering, A portion of that 10 cents is going to go to the furtherance of the gospel. I take that seriously because I want you, when you stand before God in heaven, God's going to say, hey, good job in furthering the gospel. And you're going to go, "Uh, okay, yeah, right on. (laughs) I did? (laughs) And I want to be able to hear him say, well done to you, good and faithful servant, because you know what? Part of your offering was used to the furtherance of the gospel. That is critical. Do you believe in heaven? Do you believe that Christ told us to go in all the world and preach the gospel? Not all of us have the opportunity to go. But listen to what the Bible says about that. The Bible announces to us that we can send. We in this church are either senders or goers. Isn't that great? Um, This is off the notes, but it comes to my mind. Do you remember when King David got his men together and he said, okay, we're going to go to battle and we're going to whip those nincompoops and uh, we're going to secure victory for Israel. And yeah, 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 let's go. And all these guys, I mean, these are soldiers and they're getting ready to go. And then David turns and says, now this platoon over here, you, you stay home. And let me tell you something. They were furious. We're men of war. What are you doing? What do you mean? What? And he says, no, I want you to guard all this stuff and all the people. We want to go to war. David commands them, you stand here and you guard this stuff. We're going to go to war. And when they came back with the spoils of victory, guess what? The guys who stayed home got the same amount of reward as the guys who went out to battle. There are people out in battle. You, this week or this month, heard from Jay Smith, who's in the battle, who in London preaching the gospel At the point of being beaten, two weeks before he came and spoke to you, he was beaten up and delivered from his uh, assault from the Bobbies, from the English, British police, preaching the gospel. Now you say, well, man, that's, wow, I mean, glad he's doing that. Yes, awesome, yes, glad he's doing that too. But you support him, and supporting that is proclaiming the gospel. Number three, we're to be living for the glory of God. The third thing that you and I are to be doing while we wait is to be living for the glory of God as a Christian. How many of us are Christians this morning? Raise your hands. That's a lot of glory. That's a lot of glory to be living out. God expects you and I to conduct us, conduct ourselves in our lives so that he gets the glory. Why? This, key, this is critical. The Christian, 
And I've said this before. In fact, I, I think I said it a few weeks ago. Yes, yes, it would be wonderful if the moment we accepted Christ, we'd instantly go to heaven. Gosh, that would be great, wouldn't it? Think about it. We wouldn't have need for church. We would just do evangelism. You accept Christ and you go right, look at that. Uh, and now I accept Jesus. My, wow. That would be awesome. Uh, I'd be retired if that were true. But that's not how it works. You say, yeah, why does God leave us behind here after we give our hearts to Christ? So that through your life, God gets the glory. As a Christian, through all the thick and thin, the difficulties, the hardships, the setbacks, the victories, God gets all the glory. Is that okay with you? I know, I know he's not, I'm not really asking you, I'm being sarcastic right now, but God doesn't ask us, is that okay with you, Jack, if, if I have your life to glorify me in and through it? What am I supposed to say to that? The Bible says, shall the clay pot on the wheel rise up and speak to the potter and say, why have you made me this way? No, you say, I'm the clay, you are the potter. Our prayer today as Christians is to God, use me to your glory. What glorifies you? Christian, what glorifies you in this life? And are you hanging on to it? Or what glorifies God? In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, the Bible says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the what? Glory of God. So listen, we ask ourselves this question. Is what I eat an example to other people? Now, I don't know exactly what that means. But, you know, some people say, well, yeah, to really be godly, you can only eat vegetables. Well, look, fine, eat vegetables. It's less for me to eat than go ahead and eat them all. <laughs> no, I love them, actually. In fact, the mean thing about getting older is that the older you get, everything tastes better. All Everything. Stuff I didn't like now that I'm older, I like now. And for some reason, it all is fattening now. I never liked donuts growing up. And now it's like, that's not bad. You say, well, it offends me. Then listen, I will not eat a donut in front of you if that offends you. That's what the Bible says. Is my life and what I'm eating, according to the Bible, glorifying to God? If it's glorifying to God, it will not be offensive to others. He says here about drinking. Whatever I drink is an example to others. Whatever I eat and whatever I drink, can I do that with Jesus sitting next to me? That's the question. Or whatever I do in life. In every moment of your life, Christian, I'm only speaking to the Christian this morning. While we wait, what are we to be doing? I'm to be living every moment with that imminent consciousness of Christ's return. So if God is speaking to me this morning that there's this or that in my life, that if he were to come at that moment, would it embarrass me or Christ? Then that's God this morning saying, drop it now. Are you with me? Do you hear that? If something's going on in your life, if you're reading those novels that are all steamy pornographic literature, literature, it's not even worthy to be called, it's literary pornography, with that women are reading predominantly, can you read that out loud in front of Jesus? Ask yourself that question. If he says, or if you feel ashamed or convicted, then God is saying, repent of it and drop it now. Now, if you're not convicted, then you need to, you need to accept Christ. You need to become a Christian. Or if you click on pornography and you, oh, it's okay, it's okay, you know what, me and Jesus, it's okay. No, no, are you serious? Jesus Christ sitting down next to you looking at the screen? Are you kidding me? You need to accept Christ if you're not being convicted. These are serious things. Jesus is coming back. And every generation of believers, including the Apostle Paul, lived with the consciousness of Christ's imminent return. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14. Are you guys okay, or do you wish you had a guest speaker again this morning? Huh? I just had that thought. I bet they wish I were gone again. <laughs> or maybe that's the Lord saying, Jack, Maui, Maui, Maui. I don't know. First, by the way, I wasn't there. I'm just wishing I was there. I didn't go there. I stayed home locally here. 
1 Timothy 6.14 says that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. He's coming. Number four, while we wait, we're to be judging ourselves against his word. How many times have we heard people say, don't judge me? None of us have the authority to judge anyone. We've, listen, but we've all been given the mandate by Christ to judge ourselves. Got that? I have no authority to judge you. You have no authority to judge me. But I am directly commanded by God for me to judge myself. Based on what standard? On God's standard. His standard. This. Jesus is coming back. He's coming again. And he's coming for his people. And his people are serious about getting ready to meet him. Is there anything in our lives that would keep us from being approved of by God. Notice again, we read it a moment ago in Titus 2.11. It says, For by the uh, grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, push it off, get away from it, run. Worldly lust and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in in this present age. We should look like freaks to this world. I wanted to say that. I couldn't wait to say that. The reason why is there's so much mamby-pamby Christianity about we need to be relevant. I am so sick of hearing about that. As though, listen, as though the gospel were not relevant. What is your definition of relevant? We need to be relevant. You know, pastor, you need to calm down. You need to be relevant. Excuse me? I, look, that's a real fine line of between being used by God according to God's definition and just being sold out for him or peer pressure. A fine line. What does it mean to be a Christian? Dangerous question. If you're asking people, don't ask me that. Don't ask your neighbor that. Ask God that. You see? Well, I want to be relevant. And you don't think the God of the universe who created tomorrow is not relevant? Oh, he's relevant. He's relevant. And we are to be judging ourselves in light of Scripture. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. 1 John 3, 10 says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested or revealed. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Wow. We judge ourselves. Lord, am I loving Others. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed, listen to this, unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. What a tremendous statement that is. Examine yourself. Listen, the word examine here in the original language means to test by acid test. Listen, it means every Christian. You guys okay? Every Christian is to endeavor, to scrutinize, to discipline himself. The word means assay, like a a goldsmith or an assayer. We don't use that term anymore, but some of you who are uh, chemistry people, you know this, or you've read it in history, historians that in the gold rush, for example, uh, the, the gold miners would bring gold and stuff that looked like gold, and they would bring it to the assayer's office. He would pour acid on it, and it would reveal if it was truly gold or not. We're to be doing that with our walks as Christians every day. And if anything, this ending message of this series, I pray, would be a preparatory message to prepare you for the Lord's coming. Wouldn't it be awesome if this message gets delivered and in three days, five days, 20 days, Jesus comes back? And we're like going up, I told you that Sunday. No. (laughs) Number five, while we wait, we're to be living in unity with other Christians. I should have put an if. Maybe I should have put an if on that. Let me explain it. We're to be living in unity with other Christians if. Did y'all get that? I put this in my notes intentionally, get your attention. Do I have your attention? It sounds good. We're to be living in unity with other Christians. I just gave you a half-truth 
intentionally to get your attention. There should be an if on the end of that. You know that. Oh, I am not going to make any friends in the next five minutes. I want you to be ready to meet Jesus. I'm not interested in how much you've messed up or goofed up or sinned or whatever you're doing right now. If, if, if you're a Christian and you're sleeping with bubbles right now and God is telling you, I told you to knock it off, then listen, obey him now and run from bubbles. Okay? Listen to this. The Bible commands us very carefully. 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And notice the fellowship criteria and the blood of Jesus Christ, his sin cleanse, son, cleanses us from all sin. This is a fellowship koinonia verse. It means this. It's written to all Christians. This is not referencing non-believers. This is to all Christians. If a Christian is living in sin, in your love for him or her, you're to go to them and say, man, listen, you see what the Bible says about this? Don't do that. You're destroying your life. You're destroying your family. You're, you're not leading any of these people to Christ. In fact, the life you're living is pushing people away from Jesus. Don't do it. Listen, if you love them, you can tell them. With a broken heart, by the way, don't, don't, don't go to somebody's life that you know is messed up and say, hey, <laughs> let me tell you a thing or two. Don't do that. Stay home. But if you love somebody who's messing up, you go to them with a broken heart for them, and you tell them, now, look, they're going to go to heaven. It has nothing to do with salvation, but they won't have fellowship with God. They won't have the blessings of God. They won't have God watching over them. Very, very important you understand that. We are to, while we wait, have fellowship with Christians. And if a Christian that we know is sinning, the Bible says you're not even supposed to eat with that brother, it says. Did you know that? Does this person's life lead you closer to Jesus? Yes. Good. Is this person's life leading you away from Jesus or causes you to have to shun their life that I don't want? Listen. Go to them in love, and then if they don't repent, don't fellowship with them. But listen, more than ever before, Christians who are walking with God, I, I don't know about you, but I want to be around Christians who challenge me. I want to be around Christians who have more faith, who have more works, who have more righteousness, who have more joy, who have more love, because I like being around that kind of salt. Why? Because it makes you thirsty, huh? This is hard stuff, but it's necessary stuff for you while you wait to be ready. Number six. Number six is this. Oh, I, I missed something. This is cool. Sorry. We're still back at number five. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Buy anything you can get by Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. He's now with the Lord. He's awesome. Bible expositor Donald Gray Barnhouse said, and I quote, Without this hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ alive in us, we have no gospel to preach at all. Death and the grave and Satan reign uh, forever. Without this hope of the coming of our Lord, our footsteps hesitate. Ooh, that's good, huh? Our very walk is laggard. Our hands hang nervously by our sides, for we know not what is true. We are defeated before we even begin the fight of faith. But thanks be to God, it is the blessed hope of Jesus' coming again that gives us victory in this life and a promise of resurrection and immortality in the life to come, close quote. What a great statement that is. How can you and I personally know that we are, in fact, Christians? I would, I would say two things. Number one, other people will accuse us of being Christians. That's always a good one. And number two, you'll have a desire to be ready to meet Jesus Christ. I mean this with all affection. When we have a notification in life of death approaching, do you understand the grace of God that's involved in that? The other day I was going down the 60 freeway and somebody was instantly, suddenly killed in a car crash right down the road here. In an instant, over. 
And I thought, as I went by that vehicle, did they, were they Christians? Did they have a chance to cry out? Had they say it in their life, had they said no to Jesus so much that that was their time, it was up for them? I don't know. I'll never know. But when we get a pink slip or when the doctor says, you know what, you've got hours or you've got weeks or you've got months, do you know the mercy that's involved in that? I, I'm, I, I'm not talking about the trauma and the pain of losing a loved one. I'm not talking about that. That, that we live through, that, that, that we hang on to the word of God through. I'm talking about regarding that person that is about to step into eternity and God gives you a moment of suffering and a moment of contemplation. This is God's grace, ladies and gentlemen. Don't misunderstand it. Don't misread that. When you are suffering for a moment as members of my family before they ever came to Christ, they suffered through cancers and it was that very thing that led them humbly to the foot of the cross and they accepted Christ. Suffering, listen, I could not lead my family members to Jesus. I tried for decades. And then they were visited by illness. And illness in my particular family has been the most effective evangelist our home and our generation has ever seen. God's mercy, enduring. We're to be enduring these difficult days. Suffering, yes, not giving up, yes. Guarding our faith, yes. But all these things are called normal in the Christian life. You and I are going to suffer. We are going to be tempted to give up, but we don't. We are to be guarding our hearts because there's a danger. The Bible says in Romans 7, 24, Oh, wretched man, this is Paul speaking. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then he goes into that awesome victory march of Romans chapter 8. But in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, listen to this, everybody get this. I know it's, listen, we're down to the wire. Got to get this. Wake up, write this verse down. <laughs> to the Christian, God says in Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You know what that means? The law goes like this. The Ten Commandments and the laws of God Failure, 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 failure. Why? Because it's the law is to point out your sin. But the moment you accept that responsibility and then give it to Christ, it's no longer the law. The law is now ineffective anymore. It did its job. It's over. Now, for the Christian, God says, grace, grace, grace. And the Christian says, wow, I know what I once was under the law. But now by God's grace, that gives me the power now to live for God. Sin shall not have dominion over me. This is a statement of fact. You don't have to sin in the sin that has so tripped you up in the past. Now look, in life, we will never be sinless. We will always have some battle. But we will begin as Christians to follow Christ. We will begin to sin less. We'll never stop sinning. Understand that. What gets us through? God's grace. His grace. It's his grace that says, um, how, do, you, do, you like, do you like that thought you just thunk a moment ago? No. That's God's grace. Did you know that? Do you want to you walk away from this? Yes. That's God's grace. Did you know that? And God says, I'll give you the power to walk away from sin. This thing that's been plaguing you, this besetting sin. You and I don't get up and do the same sin over and over again because God's not powerful enough or his word is somehow anemic. No, we do that because we'll entertain it. And God says, you don't have to do that anymore. I've broken that dominion over your life. You walk with me. Doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted, but you fight. We'll talk more about temptation in the next point. But true saving grace breaks the power of sin in our lives. It's awesome. And every child of God knows exactly what I'm talking about. Number seven is that very thing. While we wait, we're to be resisting all forms of temptation. Temptation. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is complete or perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him 
ought himself also, here it is, to walk just as he walked. Now listen, the context is temptation. Church, family, listen. It doesn't mean you're going to be sinless. Only Christ is sinless, as I said a moment ago. But it does say we will walk with him as he walked. How? The question this morning is, how did Jesus walk so that I might be waiting? He walked dependent upon the word of God. Please understand this. When we see the life of Jesus in the Gospels, he is not doing miracles for himself to defeat sin. You know, he never did that. He did miracles to raise the dead, didn't he? He did miracles to cleanse the lepers, didn't he? But when it came to his own fight and war against temptation, Jesus could have, wouldn't it have been, it would have been kind of cool, but I'm glad he didn't do it. When Satan shows up, hey, Jesus, cast yourself down from the top of the temple. But the Bible says the angels will bear you up so that you don't dash your foot against the stone. Wouldn't it have been great for Jesus to have just said like this, you know what? You're dead. <laughs> And he could have been dead. There would have been a miracle. He could have done it. You know what? What did Jesus do? He fought Satan's temptations with what? The word of God. Specifically, by the way, every temptation he fought against Satan with was taken right out of the book of Deuteronomy, by the way. Jesus seen, he quoted that book more than any other book in his ministry, the book of Deuteronomy. He used the word of God. The son of God used the word of God to defeat a satanic temptation. Are you being tempted? Oh, I'm going to ask you that again. We'll edit. We'll edit the radio part. So you ready? Are you being tempted? Yes. We're all being tempted. We're always tempted. But we're to resist that temptation. We're to fight it. Remember, being tempted is not a sin. It's giving in to the temptation that makes it a sin. The Bible says in Luke 4.13, now when the devil had ended every temptation, <whistles> Satan departed from him until a what? An opportune time. Yikes. Did you know that? Satan will come again knocking at an opportune time. I know we have to finish this, and I will, I promise. But you know what? Satan is not omnipresent and he's not omnipotent. He is a, he's relegated to one point in time, but he's got a big demonic force that works for him and they report to him all the time. So don't give him too much credit, okay? He's not God's opposition. God has no opposition, okay? He's Michael and Gabriel's opposition. But he, listen, and he's been around a long time. He's smart. And he knows, he studies all the trends, and he knows this is what happens in a person's life. I know from statistics, this guy will wind up making a mistake a little later. I'll wait. I'll just wait for what? An opportune time. Hey, Satan, what are you doing? Waiting for an opportune time. How does that happen? Oh, most of these knuckleheads hand me it. Huh, think about it. I don't think Satan's such a big problem in our lives. I think I'm the one that's a big problem in my life. It's like I open the door and say, hey, hey, cloven foot, pointed, horned, pitchfork, tailed, red underwear maniac who wants to destroy my life, come on in. And I leave the door wide open. God is saying, shut the door. Be ready, shut the door. Resist him. Number eight, we're to be hoping in what God has said. When I say hoping, I don't mean wishing. Hoping with confidence. In 1 John 3, verse 2, it says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. Hallelujah, right? And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know this, that when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, it's a fact, purifies himself just as he is pure. Isn't that great news? It is exciting news. Number nine, while we wait, we're to be loving others wisely. Let me explain. Hebrews chapter six, verse 11 says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience 
inherit the promises. When I say we're to be loving others wisely, this is different than the one I mentioned earlier about loving or fellowshipping with other Christians. This is both Christians and the world. You know the people that you and I know who are not Christians? We're to be loving them in one direction and Christians in another direction, in another way. God's love evident. I'm going to give you four quick things. Wisely, loving others wisely means this. Wisely pointing out to the lost their need for Jesus. I'm inspired to make that the first of the four things I mentioned now. This week I received a letter from a radio listener who said, it's obvious that you hate homosexuals and you're a hater. And I couldn't believe that because I've had friends who were homosexuals. I've, I've, listen, I buried a friend who was a homosexual. And nowhere have I ever said I hate homosexuals. Ever. But see, when you stand up against conduct that the Bible says is wrong, it doesn't mean I hate them. I'm just saying the Bible says this is wrong. It's wrong. You need to get away from that. Okay, if, look, I read a moment ago that if the truth is not in you and you say that you walk with Jesus, you are a liar. The Bible just said that. So I would say, according to the Bible, if you're not walking with Jesus, the truth is not in you and you're a liar. Oh my gosh, you're a hater of liars. No, listen, I gave you the verse that if you are a liar, that's between you and God, may he convict you and because I want you to be in heaven with us, that you would accept his love. So whenever you take a stand, the people who are convicted will throw stuff at you. Christian, take it. Because you're doing it for love. And when you love somebody wisely, you're going to tell them, you need Jesus. I do not want a doctor involved in my life who knows I'm sick and will not give me the medicine to make me well. That's a quack. Wisely, listen to this. Wisely by reaching out to the hurting. Did you know that this weekend, you, you as a church reached out to the hurting in Watts? and bless them and help them? What about those in Pomona, the homeless? Did you know that you, did you know this? Did you know that you got their hair washed in in Pomona? Did you know that the homeless got got their hair washed and cut? Did you know that some of them got their fingernails done and got clothes? Did you know that? And then they got food. Did you know that? You did that. Did you know that when they got all that stuff, then they got food? Did you know that? Did you know that goes on and it has gone on, I'm guessing now, for about 19 years? You've been doing that? You say, oh, uh, uh, I haven't even showed up. Have you put a nickel in the offering? That's how the, that empowered us to be able to do that stuff. The hurting. To reach the hurting. Love them wisely. Wisely serving the church family. In whatever capacity God is leading you to serve. You're loving. Wisely, number four, wisely by winning our family members to Christ. Having integrity, telling them honestly and loving on them. Number 10, I'm excited about number 10. We're kind of, we have a few minutes, I'm all right. Number 10, we're done with number 10, but it's cool. Number 10 is we're to be being, that's not a mistake, we are to be being like or all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Listen, the the world outside these walls, they're not going to come here because of the worship They're not going to come here because of the teaching. They're not going to come here because we have incredible carpeting or awesome colors in the sanctuary. They're not going to come here for that. If they're really, really hungering souls, they're going to be coming here because they want to know who Jesus is. It's all about Jesus. When it's all said and done, listen, strip away all this stuff. Isn't it beautiful? Think about it. If all this stuff fell out, away, if it all evaporated, listen, it's still us. And listen, what's brought us together? Jesus. What's going to get us all the way through? Who's going to get us all the way through? Jesus. What are we preaching? Jesus. He died on the cross and rose again from the grave for our sins. For the sins of the entire world if they will just believe him. Imagine that. He died for everyone. But only those who trust him get the benefits of it. So trust him today. Think of that. It's all about Jesus. In John 14, 31, the Bible says but that the world may know that I love the Father and as as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise and let us go from here. That's not my ending verse, but I wish it was. 
Wouldn't it be great to end right here? It would be great to be able to say, Arise, church, and let us go from here. You're going to do that in a minute, but it's not yet the end. In Titus 2.13, we are to be looking for, scanning the horizon for the blessed hope. The word blessed here is happy, the happy hope. Doesn't that sound cool? Like the happy hope ranch. Isn't that a great name? Makes you want to put on the front of your house, the happy home ha- happy hope house. Happy hope. Well, happy hope to you. That's a great word, isn't it? Well, I'd like to wish you happy hope. The Bible says when Jesus comes back for the believer, it's going to be a happy hope. And waiting is a happy hope. (laughs) And the glorious appearing. It's hard to put English word to the original word in in the Greek, glorious. The unveiling of Jesus Christ to our eyes as believers. We're going to see him. That's going to freak us out. But don't worry, you'll be happy about it. It's going to be awesome. I want to leave you this story. Dr. Leonard Ravenhill, commenting on the chapter and verse when Jesus says, Watch, for you do not know when the hour is that the Son of Man is coming. Watch, therefore. Ravenhill says, Just as World War II was breaking out across Europe, a young man by the name of Charlie had been engaged to be married to his beautiful Catherine. Everything had been prepared, and the wedding was just weeks away. But before they were able to be married, Charlie, like all able-bodied Englishmen, were called up for battle. A year and a half later, a note arrived for Catherine announcing Charlie's presumed death. He and his ship had been sunk by a German U-boat, and Charlie was declared MIA, presumed dead, missing in action. Many months later had passed, but Charlie was not dead. He had been found washed ashore the coast of southern England. After his recovery, Charlie made his way home to Catherine's parents' house. Upon knocking, Catherine's mom opened the door and seeing Charlie fell to her knees in shock. You look like Charlie, she whispered. I am Charlie. Is Catherine here? He asked. She is in her room. She has scarcely been out since hearing of your death. As Charlie tiptoed to her room, Gently pushing open the door enough to see Catherine standing in front of a mirror, wearing her wedding gown and holding a picture of Charlie to her breast. The door squeaked and she softly looked up and seeing Charlie, she said, oh, hello, Charlie, I missed you. Charlie was stunned by her calm and almost mechanical response. She simply returned, turned around, looking into the mirror again in a dreamlike state, until Charlie said with a loud voice, Catherine, it's me! And with that, she snapped out of her waiting, and turned around and jumped into his arms. He returned, Ravenhill says, to find her dressed in her gown and her heart fastened to him. He found her in waiting. That's how Jesus will find his church. Dressed in her gown of righteousness. Holding his word close to her breast. Waiting. And he's going to shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise. It's coming. He's coming. Are you ready to meet him? Father, we thank you for your word and for your truth. Your power that you have made us ready, not we ourselves. What fool would imagine for a moment that we could somehow from a deficit with nothing in hand better ourselves out of bankruptcy. We begin tainted. And so all of our sin has tainted us. How can we produce anything of acceptance before you? Enter the word of God, Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the grave. Our Jesus. 
My friend, this morning, are you trusting in Christ? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Do you really trust him? Today, did the Spirit of God convict you? Did he raise something to your attention that you need to deal with? And so if that's happened to you today, listen, you need to decide two things right here, right now. Be very careful. If the Spirit of God convicted you about your lust or about your idolatry of money or of power or whatever it might be, status, education, you've put it above God, maybe you're a Christian and you're backslidden and God is warning you, repent now. Maybe he's speaking to you, Christian. Or maybe you're not a Christian today. Here's the thing. Don't make the mistake of thinking you are a Christian and you're not. This is a dangerous moment. Examine your heart now. Has God changed your life and you've fallen back into sin? And Christian, come back. Are you not a Christian at all, only religious? And you don't know what it is to have the Holy Spirit of God living in your life, leading you day by day, You need Christ today. Well, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you this morning to raise your hand, and I'll see your hand. Nobody else is looking around. Everyone Jesus called, he called publicly. And the Apostle Paul says, if you believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and you confess that with your mouth, you'll be saved. All of that presupposes that you're owning your sin right now, and you're saying, Jesus, I am so sorry. I've sinned against you, God. I have made a crash of my life and I'm asking you to come into my life and to set me free now. I want to live for you. If that's you today, will you raise your hand wherever you're at right now? Awesome. God bless you. Many of you. If God is speaking to you, raise your hand. You don't don't enter into the kingdom by leaning on your mother's faith or your wife's faith or your husband's faith. You, if God is speaking, you decide now. Anyone else, raise your hand if God is speaking to you and you're saying, I'm coming to Christ. Hands all over the place. Praise God. Put your hands down. Excellent. Father, we pray now, God, we just ask you, Jesus, that your salvation would visit powerfully these who have raised their hands. Lord, it's not the hands going up that's doing it. It's the fact that their mind has been altered and affected by your Holy Spirit and convicted. Maybe this morning you're a Christian, but you've wandered from God and God is speaking to you and you've allowed little things into your life. Solomon said it's the little foxes that spoil their vineyard. And maybe as a Christian, you've allowed little things, secret things. Maybe nobody knows. But you know what? Foxes grow up. And the sin that you've allowed in, you've entertained it for a moment, but now it's grown up and it's consuming your life. Maybe you're a Christian and it's time for you to come back and recommit your life to Christ. Put your hand up wherever you're at right now. God is speaking to you. Obey him. God bless you as well. Excellent. For those of us who have raised our hands this morning, let's pray this prayer. Dear Lord, I come and I ask you to forgive me now. I proclaim Jesus Christ as the Son of God risen Savior, my Lord, my Savior, my hope. In Christ, I now trust. I give him my life. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.